Okay, so it's um, uh, almost Shavuot, and uh, just a week after Parshat Bahar B'chukotai, um, we said just finished the Tochacha, um, and it's actually my brother's Bar Mitzvah Parsha, so a Parsha that I remember uh, quite well from my, my older brother's Bar Mitzvah Parsha uh, from my childhood, um, and, uh, you know, um, it uh, raises actually an issue that I wanted to get to at the end, but fair, share a fair amount of background in uh, before we get started. Um, and that has to do with the question that um, is uh, what we call the, the topic I would call the importance of being earnest. But I would say it has to do with the question of the nature of piety. Now, piety is often uh, misunderstood and misrepresented in certain ways. What does it actually mean to be pious? Right? So. Um, you want to look at the dictionary definition of piety, right? The dictionary, the, the, uh, um, uh, according to some, it has to do with religious or reverent, um, you know, or, um, you know, to, to be pious. Um, actually, in, interesting, usually is translated as chasidut. But chasidut means something very different in the colloquial term uh, would you say, oh, you're Hasidish? Does that necessarily mean that you're pious? Um, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, is it to be pious? Often is translated as devoutly religious, but does that express itself in all the ways that we think it does? When you talk about somebody who is devoutly religious, a certain image probably pops up in your mind. But is that an accurate definition? Are there not people who are devoutly religious who there express that religious experience in a very wide variety of ways? Right. So we often will say, oh, so, right, here's a term ultra orthodox. Right. What does ultra orthodox mean? That means you could translate it as well. There are. You know, 613 mitzvot. If you're Orthodox, you'll do 70 or 80. And if you're ultra Orthodox, you'll do all 613. Or there are, um, maybe you'll say, if you're Orthodox, you do them all, but you don't do them as well. And if you're ultra Orthodox, you just do them better. Is that the definition? Right? That often will be in the, in the colloquial term, what will pop up in people's mind. But how, is that actually accurate? Does piety, or I would say intense religiosity, have to express itself in the ways you think of? A very common way of people understanding or thinking about the term religious, or I would say gradations of being religious, is based on an assumption of how strict you are, Chumrah. Is Chumrah being strict an accurate description of your religious level? Um, you could say, listen, I'm a very deeply, right, you know, there's often a, a cliche, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. <laughs> you know, Judaism has this notion of Chiyuv, obligation, right? There are 613 mitzvot, comes from the word sivui. And in a general concept, we don't necessarily often believe that they are optional, pick and choose. However, doing mitzvot in a particular way is not necessarily the same thing as being more or less religious. And I'll take it a step further. Um, you know, the gradations also, um, uh, you know, assume that if you are more restrictive, you are more pious. That does not take into account the fact that there are a variety of parts of the corpus of Jewish law that direct us to be lenient. So in a certain regard, are you more religious if you aren't lenient when the Torah told you to be lenient? If the Torah told you to be lenient, you're actually being irreligious by being extra strict. 
it's kind of a strange way to think about it. So that's what I want to, um, you know, try and delve into a little bit today and show that there's a couple of sources. Again, we've gone over this before, but I wanted to, to, to express it, you know, and focus on something different, um, which is this notion of what is the definition of being religious? So you find an interesting um, model in Avraham Avinu. Let's, let's expose Avraham Avinu, the 14th chapter of, of Bereshit. Okay, Avraham Avinu shows up in Sidon and wins a war. And with Sodom wins this war, uh, four kings, five kings, you know the story. Okay. There now is a, um, the matter of the spoils of war, which from a, uh, uh, you know, a, a purely moral and, um, you know, convention approach, especially in those days, there was nothing immoral about taking the spoils of war. That was what you were entitled to. It was appropriate. That was just the way of the world, right? Maybe it's a little bit different now, but that's the way it was. No question. That's not what we're going to um, uh, delve into. Okay. So the Torah says the following. The king of Sodom says, let's split up the spoils. I'll take this. You take that, etc." Says Avram. El Melech Sodom. He makes an oath to God. He says, I will not take from a shoelace or a thread from these spoils for the reason he states. Okay, so um, the notion appears at first superficial glance to be that what Abraham is saying is even something that I am entitled to, I've decided I'm not going to take it. Now let's think about the story of Abraham because we're going to come back to it. He's decided I'm not going to, I'm entitled to it. No, nobody's arguing about my entitlement. I have a concern. So I'm going to be especially stringent strict and not take advantage of something to which I am entitled because of, uh, I don't want to say which we'll get back to. So on one hand, you seem to say um, the concept of the model of Avraham is that an expression of piety is expressed through this notion of um, abstaining from something to which you are legitimately entitled. We will see that this is a straw man because it's not actually as, uh, as applicable as we may think. But let's take a second example, a second uh, point. So it looks like Avraham expressed his piety by being stringent and not taking advantage of something that he was allowed to get. Let's use another example. Point number two. Famous Mishnah in the beginning of Pirkei Avot, Moshe, Kibel, Torah, Sinai, Moshe. We see the Torah from Sinai, pass it to Joshua, pass it to the elders, the prophet, da, 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 da. And one of the core principles that is presented at the very beginning of the layout of Jewish history and Jewish, uh, you know, uh, um, traditional uh, um, faith doctrine is... Asu siag la Torah. So this is a second issue, a second point, where we are commanded by the entire corpus of Jewish history, which we just uh, laid out from Moshe all the way to the Great Assembly. Asu siag la Torah, right? Which is generally make a fence around the Torah. Now, what is the concept of a fence around the Torah? A fence around the Torah is what you will often have, especially in rabbinic law, where something is explicitly forbidden in the Torah. And in order to make sure that you don't uh, 
you know, attach it too much, you don't get too close. We say don't do something even further afield so that you don't get close enough to uh, potentially, you know, get the, uh, the, the example would be you have a big pit and you have a big pit that, uh, you know, if you fall in, you're going to be in big trouble. So we keep for 30 feet away from the pit, we put a big fence. So you don't even get close to the pit to even have the possibility of getting in trouble. Right. So, for example, the Torah writes explicitly, you're not allowed to eat meat and milk that is cooked together. A fence around that is don't even have meat and milk at the same meal. Right. Because you have the actual explicit prohibition in the Torah. Then we put a fence around that so you don't come close to the potential of this serious, significant spiritual danger of eating milk and meat that is cooked together. How do we approach that? Because that comes a little bit closer to the notion that says, you know what, how you express your religiosity? By even when something is permitted, on the most basic technical level, you say, no, what, I'm going to forbid it. Asu siag la Torah. Make a fence around the Torah. And this is seen positively in the... Uh, a corpus of Jewish history, right? The first Mishnah and Pirkei Avot. This is what they say to do, right? And by the way, it's not that the rabbis made it up in Pirkei Avot. It's a pasuk in the Torah. It says, Ushmartem et mishmarti, which is understood to mean, Asum mishmeret, mishmeret from the word guardian, limishmarti, the mishmeret, our original heritage is the Torah, and you're supposed to put something that guards your act, you know, your, your potential of violating that which is explicitly in the Torah. So that's example number two that seems to present this possible approach of being pious means being more strict. You express your piety as saying, I'm not only not going to eat meat and milk that's cooked together, I'm not even going to have meat and milk at the same meal. I'm even going to have meat and milk dishes that are going to be separate, right? Uh, as they say, ad just as a side point, by the way, I have found that this seems to resonate sometimes a little bit more over the course, especially in last January and the earlier parts of the pandemic, because the idea was the stakes are so high. Remember way back in last March, where we said, don't even go out of your house to have an outdoor, I remember at the very beginning, we were for 10 weeks, right? Not in shul. And there was a thought that people should go out on their lawns, right? Our street happens to have uh, people go out on their lawns and at least say you did nefesh at the same time, right? Uh, um, we're learning now that, especially once you're vaccinated, you probably could be without a mask outdoors. That's the way it is in Israel. Um, it seems to be that way, you, you know, Fauci announced that, Dr. Fauci announced that this morning and the CDC may have said that as well, you know, so you could now, after we know more, so, but what was the rationale there? Especially when COVID was rampant, the rationale was the stakes are so high, right? The, the, the virus is so virulent, rampant and dangerous that you're going to take a step away from a step away. You're sitting in your own house singing you did nefesh 45 feet away from your next neighbor who's on their porch singing you did nefesh the chance of transmission of covid in that situation is probably pretty close to nil but it was generally accepted especially in the earlier part things kind of uh changed in different communities over time to say the stakes are so high that we're going to pick a fence to a fence to a fence to a fence and when you get closer you're going to be in a mask and you should be in a double mask and that's Absolutely appropriate when it's those appropriate, you know, public health guidelines based on all the things that public health guidelines are based on. But it, it made this notion of siag a little bit more resonant and palatable because you're saying when the stakes are very high, you don't want to play games at the edge of the pit. So the idea was assume mishmeret lemishmarti. So again, you have here 
um, the two examples, Avram saying, I'm not going to take the spoils, this notion of Asus Yagla Torah. And of course, you have the famous Ramban and Parsha Kedoshim, right? The Ramban and Parsha Kedoshim has a very interesting, uh, um, uh, uh, requires a, a very, very interesting analysis, right? The Ramban and Parsha Kedoshim says that, and here you need to really read it carefully. The, the Ramban is dealing with the question of why the Torah gives you such an amorphous mitzvah called be holy, right? The Ramban says, what does that mean, right? I know what it means, light Shabbat candles. I know what that means, and light a candle. I know what it means, eat a kazayat of matzah. I measure exactly how much matzah, and I eat that matzah. I know what the Torah means when it says sit in the sukkah, right? I build a sukkah, it has to be these dimensions, and I sit in the sukkah on sukkah. What does it mean when the Torah just says, be holy? So what does the Ramban say? Ramban says, the idea of ha'inyan, ki ha'torah is hira ba'arayot u'machalim asurim ve'hetira ha'bi'a ish bi'ishto ba'chilera basar ba'yayim. Says the Torah recognizes the um, concept of um, the you know notion of worldly pleasures, and I'm not even just saying worldly things, worldly pleasures, right? So uh, um, those things that are pleasurable in the world, right? Human contact, right? Uh, um, yeah, uh, um, you know, food. The Torah says it is not forbidden to eat meat and wine, or have you know, uh, 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 marital relations between married couples, right? Those things are not forbidden. The, those actions are not problematic actions. And then he says, but if that's the case, then you could have a situation where someone is overly gluttonous to a extreme point, right? So you could say, okay, meat is kosher. So then if somebody's going to sit from morning till night, I know, with a, a drooling, are they being religious when they spend all day eating kosher meat and drinking kosher wine? Is that a religious act? Is it a forbidden act? No. Every drop of wine is kosher. Every bite of meat is totally kosher. But, um, right, um, uh, 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 the notion of speech. Of course you're allowed to speak. It's great to speak, but you could speak in a vulgar manner. Are you violating any official text in any particular statute or subsection, etc.? Um, you could say, what do you mean? Lowe's carry syrup is that I never said I'm not allowed to eat meat. Never said I'm not allowed to drink wine. And that's the famous phrase that Ramban says, Naval Bershida Torah. You're a glutton with the Torah's permission. In theory, you could follow every rule to the letter and still be a gluttonous, uh, un, you know, unsavory person. The The Torah said, you know what? After it goes through the details of what is permitted and forbidden, which animals are kosher, which animals are not kosher, which wine can you drink, which wine can you not drink, which of this, this can you do, which can you not do. Then the Torah says, okay, I gave you all the details, but there needs to still be a general principle. Now this is a word, motarot is one of the most misunderstood words of the Ramban. The Ramban saying, therefore, so when the Torah can't just stop after saying, don't do X and don't do Y, because you could do all the, you know, you, you know you're allowed to do all these things, but you could still be somebody who is not, I'll call a tighter dick a person, a person who is within the model that the Torah believes is the way one should live one's life, right? And therefore, the Torah has a general rule, be holy. And the notion of being holy, says the Ramban, means pirushim, separate ourselves. Right, that you're not immersed in these worldly acts. And here's the key: Vinham Motarot. So some people translated the word motarot as from the word mutar, permitted. And what the Ramban is saying is 
what you should do is refrain, abstain from doing permitted things. That's what people said to Rambam, right? It's permitted to have wine, but don't do it so much. It's permitted to have meat, don't do it so much. The word, however, motarot, actually, in this case, I think means the word excess. That's what the Ramban is saying. The Ramban is saying, it is totally fine to have a delicious Shabbos meal or go out to a restaurant, you know, uh, with, um, you know, a, a great cuisine or have a, you know, a beautiful bottle of wine for Kiddush or for Lachayim. All wonderful. Just be careful of the motarot doing it to excess. The Ramban is preaching the notion of moderation. And that's, I think, a key point of understanding this Ramban in a nuanced way. But the Ramban is saying moderation is the key. And there is a prohibition of the Torah to live life out of moderation, which I think is the linchpin to move, I would say, the, the, the um, conversation to pivot, where it does not mean to be, uh, to, you know, you'll find time, sometimes a, a term in the Mishnah Brura, especially, where it says, Hamachmir Tabo Bracha. Somebody who is strict, blessings should be upon them. Why? Because they are designed, because of their religious conviction, to be extra careful or to be extra uh, um, intense in their observance of a particular mitzvah. Now, that mitzvah might be the tefillah, that mitzvah might be chesed. I'm really strict about doing chesed, and therefore I make sure to drive a Tom Shabbos route or this or that. Right? I'm really strict, really pious about my Beit Adam Lachavero. Therefore, I make sure to be especially careful to speak nicely to people. Right? You could, the, the point is, that is piety. That's a Jewish value, which I'm very careful about. And so I'm very careful about that. that I'm a pious person because I follow that Jewish value. What the Ramban is saying is that um, there is no prohibition of engaging in all the different things the world has to offer. God put them there for a reason. But the idea is not to be a glutton, not to be, to be in the concept of motarot, which, by the way, goes to the point, we've quoted this before, of the Tefillah Zaka. The Tefillah Zaka, we say that we apologize to God on Yom Kippur for, as we have said many times, right? that I apologize for being strict when God said it's okay to be lenient. You apologize for that. And that's, I think, a very, very powerful point, right? The famous uh, line the Rambam, Rambam says about the Nazir. The Nazir, who is the person who uh, promises makes an oath, a man or a woman who makes an oath to abstain from drinking wine or anything having to do with grapes or cutting hair or getting into near a dead body. And again, the Ramban says, the famous Ramban, um, it says, the Nazir requires atonement why does he have to atone for which he sinned? Rabbis explain that if a Nazir abstain only from wine needs atonement, how much more a person who abstains from all worldly pleasure? Therefore, our rabbis commanded, and I say the word commanded here, that a person should not refrain from that which the Torah has not commanded him to refrain. If the Torah says it's, happy, it's okay to have, uh, have uh, you know, um, food, have food. Don't, uh, and by the way, you should know that this has been a, huge issue over multiple generations of Jewish history. There were times, and uh, if you went to the lecture with Dr. Abramson a week or two ago, um, he mentioned about there were folks who did what they called sigufim. What are sigufim? As a practice of an expression of piety, they would sleep outside in the snow to cause themselves more trouble and difficulty and basically pain. To afflict difficulty upon themselves as an expression of eschewing all worldly pleasures. Who cares about the cold in you know, Poland in the middle of the winter? 
I am super, you know, expressing my piety and I don't want to have these worldly pleasures like a blanket or a fire in my fireplace. And what the Ramban, Rambam is saying, you know what? Be really careful about such a thing. So as the Rambam, Rambam pointed out, it's a nuanced proposition. And it is, a set, in a sense, there is this concept of building a fence around the Torah. You know, you show how much you care about something by how much effort and focus you, you invest into it. Think about a great, you know what a really great example is? Jewish education, right? Jewish education for children requires some of the most intense sacrifices of almost any endeavor. And it, I don't just mean money. Money is a big part of it, right? The, you know, um, the tuitions are very, very high. But also to have a true Jewish education, you have to have investment of, you know, really thoughtful Jewish role modeling, right? You have to make a Shabbat table. That is an inspiring experience. You have to educate people by bringing them exposure to Jewish values in a way that in prior, you know, uh, uh, balances between, as they say, small dochal, you mean mikarevet, right? You are very careful to have clear boundaries about what the Jewish, uh, you know, uh, religion preaches, but also to have uh, uh, a sense of welcomingness and openness and welcoming, welcoming and opening and open to, to provide for individual expression. It is so much easier to simply say, I don't want to invest in it. But you go above and beyond when you want to raise a Jewish family to, to make that kind of investment. So that's a really interesting uh, you know, example of Piety, I would say, right? You're being pious. You're saying, I'm not just going to say, oh, I'll just forget about it and whatever the chips will fall. You invest in creating a Jewish educational environment because it's that serious. The stakes are that high. And you are, you know, really uh, intensely passionate about it. So that's an expression of, yeah, you probably have to give up on certain things to be able to have a Jewish education, right? You give up on the, uh, um, you know, a lot of creature comforts to pay for it. You give up a lot of easy way out type of things to role model it. You give up on a lot of free time to spend time, you know, uh, uh, building a beautiful Shabbat experience, etc. You got to give up a lot. And Judaism says, that's wonderful that you're willing to give that up. And that is an expression of your piety, but not always giving up on the world is expression of being pious. And that's why you got to figure out exactly what's what. The Ramban says, be careful to do things in moderation. The Nazir who says, you know what? Forget it all. No wine, no this, no that. Brings a sacrifice of a atonement because they share chatal and effort. So that's the basic point. Again, something that we've shared before. So what we... If talked about is how do you balance this paradox? How do you balance the machmir tabola bracha, the concept of I want to be careful about not, um, uh, uh, you know, potentially violating any avera to show how much I truly care about something and therefore I'm going to invest a lot of time and energy into it. On the other hand, being a slave to chumra, which by the way is not out right. The Gemara and Beitzah says koach de teradif that the Mark of a true mentor or, uh, 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 you know, decisor is someone who's able to be lenient. Strict is a lot more easier. Ah, just strict all the time. To be lenient means that you really know your stuff and I'm going to be able to think a little bit harder and find a way why this isn't allowed to do. So that's the, uh, the Rambam um, expressing about Nazir. And that's the idea of the balanced, nuanced approach we need to take. So what... We need to try and do is there a set of rules? Are there rules of the road to um, navigate? When are you supposed to be saying, okay, I'm going to go extra pious? And when are you saying, oh, no, that's too far? So we mentioned the Shulchan Aruch 
talks about that um, uh, when you have other people at stake, right? You're welcome to decide to be strict on your own time and on your own personal spiritual cheshbon, but not on anybody else's back. And so that was the story of, for example, the Hasid Shoteh, the pious fool. What's the pious fool? A man who sees the woman drowning in the river and says, it's inappropriate to look at women, so I can't save her. Right? That uh, at the expense of someone else's well-being, you decide you're going to be strict. Right? The, the, um, the Shfus Yaakov says the, the story of the people who refused to sit in the sukkah when it was raining. He says, you decide that you're so strict about sukkah that, sorry, refuse to go inside. You're going to stay outside in the rain. All that's very nice, but don't you have a family who doesn't necessarily want to sit out in the pouring rain in whatever city in Europe you're in? And therefore, you don't have the flexibility to be strict. Just as a side point, going back to the first source we talked about, let's look at it again. What happened to Avraham Avinu? Avraham was entitled to the spoils. He decided he didn't want to take it, but you know what he said at the end? He says, I'm willing to decide I don't want even a shoelace or a thread, but I'm not making that decision for my soldiers, for my, my colleagues who are entitled. I've decided I'm not going to take, but there's no reason I'm going to stop anybody who else is entitled that they should be able to take. And so that is the... Um, that is the uh, the concept, the, the 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 value of not doing a, the chumrah on someone else's back. What I wanted to express today, and this is a you know getting to a little, I want to express is a couple of other points. I want to actually end um, with something that was in last week's parsha. Right, last week's parsha, the Arachayim deals with the famous phrase. Um, Right? So that will, uh, we talked about in Parsha, which means if you follow my statutes. We'll, we'll, we'll explain that. And then it says, and you guard my mitzvot. Okay. So the Mepharshim um, try to understand what exactly does it mean. You'll walk in my statutes again. That the Torah says, if you walk in my statutes, if you follow my rules, then things will be great. And if you don't, that's when we have the Torah, other things will be done. Um, so the, anybody hear my background, uh, uh, a peanut gallery here? Hi, buddy. You want to come and say hi? Let's see here. Uh, come. See a little buddy coming to say hi? Can't hear you. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, this is Akiva. He's saying hi. Um, so the Torah says in Parsha Bichukotai uh, that uh, what does that mean? So the common approach Rashi takes is how you, what does it mean to walk in the statutes? That refers to what's called Amelim Batura. I mean, the Matara means really, again, uh, immersion, really working hard when it comes to Torah values, right? Putting in uh, that, that, that work ethic, that hard work on your spiritual life. The Arachayim has a totally different take. He says something fascinating, Rabbi Chaim Ben Atar. He says that this is based on the Mishnah in, Mesa, in, in Pirkei Avot that says, Lo am ha'aretz chasid. Yeah. Lo Amaretz Chasid is um, the principle of an ignorant person will not be a pious person. That's what it says. Okay. So, what exactly does that mean? 
So we usually assume, meaning you're not going to be able to follow all the rules if you don't know what they are. Lo Amar it's Chasid. The Archaim says something different. The Archaim says um, it is forbidden to make fences and stringencies if you are not at that particular stage in your personal spiritual development. Fascinating. Right? The Torah, the Pirmish Nebuchadnezzar says, Lo Amar Etz Chasid, which means um, usually it's a description. Somebody who's an Amar is not going to be a Chasid. The Arachayim says, no, that's not what it means. It means, Lo Amar Chasid means the person who is a Am Haaretz dare not be a Chasid. He is not allowed to act in a particular way of, you know, seen as those particular pious, meaning know your own spiritual level, know who and what you are, know what type of world you live in, know what type of family you impact, know all the different factors, and therefore don't take on things that are not particularly appropriate for you, especially as each and every one of us are on a journey. We're always growing. We're always getting more. We're always trying to achieve more and raise our own level. So if you are at level this, don't skip steps to a rung that's only up here. Take things step by step. Lo am haaretz chasid and am haaretz should not be a chasid. And so if you think about somebody who is learning to play piano, don't set yourself up that you're only successful if you can play an aria or whatever, you know, a concerto or a piano, you know, uh, uh, um, after your first lesson. No. First, you'll learn this, then you'll learn that, then you'll learn that, and then at some point you'll be able to play that. So the um, idea is, and this will take it even a step further, says the, uh, the Orachayim, that's what it means in which means if you follow my statutes, says, This is what the Torah means. If you follow my laws, referring to the basic observances of the Torah, only then may you guard my statutes, meaning make fences and stringencies to add to the basic laws, right? It says, first go with what it says in the books. First, do what the 613 mitzvot are. And, the, the, you know, obviously, the, the dis- we're not discussing things that are permitted or forbidden, right? If something's forbidden, don't do it. If something's permitted, do it. Um, we're saying those things which are permitted, which some people decide that they're not going to partake in, make that decision very carefully. Don't be a glutton. And this, by the way, is a very, very famous notion that was popularized, especially by Rav Neshul, of that concept of nikudat habchira. Nikudat habchira is the term that refers to the notion of every single person has free will, but sometimes it's free will about something else. So for the, uh, again, uh, uh, for me, I happen to, thank God, uh, not be, uh, um, uh, never touched a cigarette in my life. Not a smoker. Never touched it. You know, would never allow anybody close to me to touch it. And therefore, since that's not been part of my experience, abstaining from smoking a cigarette is not even almost an expression of my free will. Because I have no desire to do it, no interest in doing it. And so if I would come home to my wife and chemist, you know what? I didn't smoke one cigarette today. She says, okay, now go eat your dinner. You know, uh, that wouldn't be a cause for celebration because that has not been a struggle for me. Thank God, Baruch Hashem. There are people for whom they have gone through a terrible struggle of addiction to all whatever substance it may be, you know, uh, addiction to cigarettes. And they put in a tremendous amount of effort. They fight and push and pull to be able to say, you know what, I went this way, or I went sober for this amount of time. And that's something that we will celebrate for that person. 
because that's their nikudata bechira, right? You think about it as a battlefield, right? So, you know, uh, the, the up until this point, right? All the uh, my army, all the area behind me, I've captured already. Nobody's trying to take that away from me. My enemy, all there behind them, they've captured already. What is the struggle? The struggle is that piece in the middle. And I get to try to go a few inches there, try to push a few inches, they push me a few inches back, whatever it may be. So that is that the same thing on that the notion of Bechira. So what the Orachayim is saying is, it is inappropriate to try and take things upon yourself that are outside of that realm of your Nikuda Tabchira, your point of choice. And, and so what the idea, what he's saying is that is a very strong argument against senseless humra, senseless stringencies. Right? That's what the Torah is essentially commanding you not to do. Not to take things on for you. You need to make a truly self-aware cheshbon, or as I say, a cheshbon hanefesh, right? A truly self-aware accounting for yourself. Does this get me, quote unquote, closer to God or does it not? And that's the key here. And what the, what the Orachayim is uh, um, saying is, uh, um, you know, be really careful. And it's not always the answer. Just be more strict all the time. Um, so, you know, the uh, concept of this notion of Chumrah is a very delicate one where he says, don't do it more than what you are at your Nukudat Abchira for. Right? The classic example is the story of Adam and Chava. Or I'd say that goes at, you know, a, a separate point. Um, but the concept of if you're climbing a ladder and you skip a bunch of rungs, you know what you're going to do? You're going to fall off. That's exactly right. And so the notion of Chumrah, the notion of, of piety, is not the same for every person, nor should it be. And that's the point I wanted to bring out of the concept of no one can compare their piety to someone else's piety. Now, here's an interesting point, which is the idea of um, relative piety is super important because you may say, oh, this person who has worked on themselves to a highest degree and therefore they maybe are at the appropriate level or at the appropriate experience to be super strict. Somehow that's, they're higher in the eyes of God than someone who is just at a different level and just trying to push harder to get where they are. We say lefum tsara agra, the definition of lefum tsara agra is where you are at your stage, what you push harder to do is the, uh, exactly what Hashem wants from you. Interesting story about the Maharam Shik, right? The Maharam Shik said, was, was known, he uh, was a great rabbi, he was known for disappearing for 20 minutes at a time on uh, Yom Kippur over the course of the day. He would go into his private room. And one day the students, you know, asked him, he says, I go into my private room. So one day he had a little bit of a chutzpin yak student who would sneak in behind the door. What's the rabbi doing when he goes into this tiny room for 20 minutes at a time here over the course of Yom Kippur? And he snuck in and he saw, do you know what the rabbi was doing? He was eating some crackers. And the student was appalled. Is this great rabbi eating crackers? What's going on? And so the rabbi explained to him, sat him down. First of all, probably told him it wasn't so appropriate to sneak in. But he explained, let me explain what's going on. I have a very serious medical issue that requires me to eat on Yom Kippur. Great. And, but here's the, here's the key point, which I think is a very resonant notion. He says, for me, observing Yom Kippur means eating these crackers. For you, observing Yom Kippur means fasting all day and all night, you know, the 25 hours. Meaning, for me, God sees this as my way of fasting Yom Kippur, and that's great. And, that, you know, again, 
I shouldn't be eating Yom Kippur if I'm not medically required to do so. But if you are, then your eating is your expression of your following God. And it's a strange way. God, you know, for, for equally sees that, uh, that notion of, um, you know, the, the appropriate, um, the appropriate, uh, you know, uh, uh, experience of Jewish religiosity. In this case, is eating on Yom Kippur. You know, getting to the point, I mean, again, getting to the point where you are stepwise climbing as is appropriate for you is exactly what is appropriate for you. It's the famous story of Moshe Feinstein, who, um, you know, would routinely make a seum on the entire shas, the entire corpus of the Talmud. One time there was a fellow who asked him, says, I just studied a page of Talmud. And the Chafetz Chaim, and, and Rosh Feinstein says, all right, we're going to make a big seum for you. And then a whole gala seum, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, a ceremony for him. And again, people asked, what do you mean? He just finished one page of Talmud. He says, do you know how much effort he put and how much it meant to him to finish that page of Talmud? That will is deserving for him as the same ceremony as it would be deserving for somebody else who finishes an entire tractate or the whole corpus of Talmud. Um, so the concept here is that stepwise personal definition of piety. And that goes back to what we started. We said, does piety mean being more strict? Does piety mean wearing X, Y, and Z that is the you know, natural things that pop into our mind? No, piety is maybe for those people that piety is expressed that way. And matovu manaim, for others, piety is expressed in a different way. And that's exactly the point that Archaim is making. I'll just end with one point, which is that last idea is to understand the difference between chumra and din, right? What is key here is to understand what is meant to be an expression of piety and what is an actual following the letter of the law and understanding that difference because blurring that line is also potentially detrimental, right? Because, you know, uh, uh, yeah, so, you know, an expression of piety is something that we said it could be nuanced about doesn't mean that you can decide that I'm simply because, you know, I, I, I'm deciding I'm not going to follow the basic rules because I'm not at that point. The basic rules are the basic rules. So what was the story with that Adam and Chava, right? What did um, the snake say to Chava? Did God say, should I eat the grain in the garden? The woman said, of through the trees, we, we, we may eat. But of through the tree that is in the middle of the garden, God said, you shall not eat of it and you shall not touch it. Lest you die. And so, uh, especially, uh, you know, uh, the Malbim has a really beautiful essay about this. Because you know what the issue was in the Garden of Eden with the snake and Chava? Was blurring the line between what's the law and what's the Chumra. And if you mess that line up and you put all the eggs in, okay, I'm focusing on the strictness. And then the strictness somehow misleads you, you end up getting misled much more significantly. And that led to the downfall of Adam and Eve. That was, he says, the issue of Adam and Chava, the blurring the line between Chumra and Din. So you have to know what the Din is, but recognizing that piety and that going the extra level of how that's different between person to person is that key point. Yes, Suzanne, go ahead. I always was upset about, you hear me, right? I always mm -hmm. was upset because... Uh, the rabbis didn't get it right. Chava wasn't there when God told Abe, when God told Adam not to. Mm -hmm. It was before she was made. Right. Okay. And why didn't anyone touch on it? Who knows what Adam told her? Just don't right, go there. Right. Don't go, Don't touch it. Yeah. So that's, that's what the rabbi said. With that's what the rabbi said did with the women. They were not allowed to learn because they were not able to learn. They forgot that they were able in the Tanakhic days, but they forgot later. <laughs> and, then, yeah. and then women became more strict than what, uh, what the law was. was. In the Torah, and especially in Yeshut. Mm -hmm. It is horrible. 
Yep, yep, yep. And that's exactly and the point. That... At the end and serves them right as the man. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think the point that you're making goes along the lines of the same, the same ideas that we're sharing. Um, okay, so with that, I want to wish everyone, again, in, in Eretz Yisrael, everything should be assured, but it's very, very scary and our davening and our learning and our piloter are together with you. Um, and uh, we should be at, just as a quick update, um, we uh, hopefully will be on next week, but uh, we're going to be taking a bit of a summer break for a good part of the month of June. July, I hope to be back, but um, I actually hope to be uh, um, you know, everything should we have a, a wedding, a family wedding. Um, that I hope to be able to join. Um, and so um, I was just like, we're probably going to be off for a good part of June um, to take a little bit of a summer recess, but I look forward to connecting. But we are, even though it's Shavuot this coming week, we are going to be on uh, next Thursday. All right. I want to wish everyone all the best.